So, okay. Um, right. So, uh, as uh, as Ricardo kindly introduced there, um, I'm going to talk about the UK's uh, response to the increase in risk of uh, wildfires. Um, but first of all, it's probably just useful to talk to uh, very briefly to Paul Headley, who was uh, previously the National Fire Chiefs Council. Um, Chief Fire Officer and Lead for Wildfire for the UK. And Paul uh, retired just a, a couple of months ago. So if I can just ask you to flick to the second slide, uh, please, Brian. Oh, so you've got the uh, pictures of uh, Paul and Jim McNeil uh, and myself. So Paul, as I say, retired a couple of, a couple of months ago. Um, he's gone on to uh, hopefully spend some more time with his family. Certainly didn't seem to be able to do that much in his last few years of his career. He was busy doing uh, his wildfire activity and running Northumberland Fire and Rescue Service. So um, Paul's moved on. Jim McNeil, uh, pictured in the middle there, he's the uh, newly appointed Deputy Chief Officer in Northumberland. Um, he's worked for Paul uh, for the last few years. So Jim has taken up the national lead role for wildfire uh, with the National Fire Chiefs Council uh, and I'll be the deputy to Jim. So um, hopefully between uh, the pair of us and colleagues on the call uh, and many other interested parties across the UK will be able to uh, push forward this wildfire uh, agenda and hopefully improve the um, the ability of not just England but the devolved administrations of uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, to come together alongside colleagues from uh, Europe and indeed uh, over the pond in the US and Canada uh, to really um, move the UK forward. Uh, next slide, Brian, please. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of content of the presentation, uh, I'm going to touch briefly upon what the NFCC um, uses a definition of wildfire, um, share with you a little bit of insight in terms of volume of, of wildfires and activity in recent years, particular focus on the 2022 season. Um, so some observations from that, uh, a bit of an overview and uh, certainly 2022 was a significant uh, year for wildfires in the UK. I'm then going to talk a little bit around wildfires and their um, relationship with other natural hazards and how we are um, preparing, preventing uh, and, and ultimately responding uh, in the UK and then uh, one or two conclusions at the end of that. Uh, next slide Brian please. So uh, through the NFCC, we have um, what we use across the, the UK Fire and Rescue Services um, National Operational Guidance. And in relation to wildfire specifically, uh, and what we determine as being um, a wildfire for our statistical reporting, um, this is the definition that we apply. So an uncontrolled vegetation fire, which requires a decision or action regarding suppression, and as you can see there, um, there are five key criteria. So largely it's around geographical area, um, number of uh, fire appliances deployed to it, the duration of the incident, uh, and perhaps less so at the moment because we have difficulty recording some of these aspects, but um, around detail around flame length and uh, similarly, the uh, serious threat to life, property, infrastructure, uh, and so on. And again, um, I'd be interested to hear from colleagues at the end of the call how you gather perhaps some of that data, because uh, certainly when you look across those four or five different um, themes there, whether it's life, property, infrastructure, environment, or financial, um, I think some of that information is perhaps easier to gather um, at the time of the incident than other aspects. So i um, happy to... Um, get any thoughts, observations, ideas that you've uh, got, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, next slide. Thank you. So why does the NFCC use this definition? Um, it could be argued, and indeed some, some of our colleagues in the UK do argue that um, by using this definition, um, the National Fire Chiefs Council essentially excludes a lot of smaller vegetation fires that we do attend. And indeed, it follows that a small vegetation fire um, can grow to become what we would term, um, as per the NOG guidance, a wildfire. 
and thereby every small fire is essentially a near miss for us. Um, but we believe that it's not particularly useful for um, us to group all of this, this incidents together. Um, what we are seeking to do really is um, draw attention to the more significant, the more damaging wildfires that we have in the UK. So if we look at vegetation fires over the last year, in the broader sense, uh, our statistics would say that we've attended around 30,000 vegetation fires. Um, but from the criteria that we apply at NFCC, um, those numbers are just shy of a thousand for the last year. So you can see there's, there's quite a difference in the volume there. What we're seeking to do is not dilute the significance of wildfire by reporting against every small vegetation fire that we have. And that's why we continue to um, adhere to those criteria. Certainly it is a point of some discussion and uh, government uh, stakeholders in, in, in other areas of policy development and indeed government um, may have a different view on that, but that's um, our current position at the moment. We also believe that that assists us to um, perhaps more effectively uh, develop our anal uh, analysis um, and our capability to be able to interrogate um, all aspects of those fires. So essentially we're saying we're going to top slice um, the most significant fires and focusing on those in terms of causation, impact, uh, resource commitment and, and so on. Okay. Um, we'll move on, Brian, please. Hopefully now, uh, colleagues, you've got uh, a graph in front of you there showing total wildfire in England and Wales. Is that correct? If somebody could nod. Yeah, there is, yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's great. So this shows um, total number of wildfires going back to 2018, and you can see there 2022 which will be the focus of uh, uh, some slides later on in this presentation, was uh, very, very significant for us. We had 63 wildfires in 2018. Um, this was only partial years recording, so um, we can't play, place too much uh, emphasis on that. Um, as we moved into 2019, we were still embedding the wildfire reporting system that we have in the, uh, uh, at this moment in time, and that's what we term our national reporting tool. That's where information gets passed through from the fire control rooms directly into that central database, um, uh, and that we then report on through NFCC. From 2020 onwards, we're slightly more confident in the data, uh, 2020, we recorded 143 wildfires, and then in 2021, 237. 983, it jumped to uh, in 2022, um, which you see there is a 500 plus percent uh, increase on previous years. Um, this was the first year that every UK Fire and Rescue Service recorded at least one wildfire meeting that criteria. Up to that point, there had been many areas of the UK that had never felt the effects of a wildfire. They'd largely been uh, immune to them. So the extended hot, dry period that we had, um, which really continued through, throughout uh, the summer, but particularly noticeable through July, August, um, really drove those numbers up. And as I say, every UK Fire and Rescue Service recorded uh, at least one wildfire within their, within their geographical area. The majority of UK Fire and Rescue Services reported multiple wildfires, um, with one Fire and Rescue Service in particular recording over 120 uh, during that year. Year to date, 2023, we're looking um, much, much lower levels. So we're in the about 285 thereabouts um, across England, uh, England and Wales uh, in the current year. So even if we discounted 2022 as per the, the graph that's in front of you there, we're still on an upward trajectory. But clearly, um, all the, uh, the right conditions prevailed last year almost the perfect storm in terms of wildfire across the UK. Very dry vegetation, long hot uh, periods, very little wet rainfall, 
and of course, uh, as is often the case, um, some human behavioural aspects which um, led to some of these incidents occurring. We can move on please, Brian. Okay, hopefully now um, you've got the EFFIS annual st statistics. So these are European Forest Fire Information System data. Uh, which uses satellite information to detect large wildfires of approximately 30 hectares or more. Um, these fires uh, can be detected by satellites, uh, and we're fairly confident that these are unlikely to detect what we term controlled burning or prescribed burning um, because of the sheer scale of them. The blue line on the graph in front of you shows the large number um, of, uh, sorry, the number of large wildfires detected. And again, we see a general increase in trend there. Uh, the red bars or the orange bars, depending on the, the colouring on your screen, uh, show the area burned by the wildfires. Uh, and again, there's an increase in trend there. So it, it plays out all the uh, research and, and al analysis that we've all been uh, privy to in recent years. The area burned in 2019, which is the highest uh, bar on your chart there was the most significant area on record um, within the EFFIS system and was actually greater than the area burned in the same year within many of the southern Mediterranean countries. So again, in terms of size and scale, um, we're seeing unprecedented uh, levels of incidents and also the scale of those incidents has increased significantly. Right. Um, the next few we'll we'll just flip through because these are just some images of the wildfires that we had in 2022, uh, and I am conscious of time, Ricardo. I'm keeping a, an eye on that. So hopefully you've got there in front of you April, um, an area called Canford Heath. That's Dorset. So for anybody that's uh, not overly familiar with the geography of the UK, Dorset is right down towards the uh, the southwest corner um, of the UK, that southern coast area. Um, and that incident was point in case, 25 uh, fire service appliances, 17 hectares of triple um, SI, so that's sites of uh, specific scientific interest. Um, so very, very valuable in terms of environment, um, animal life and so on. 17 hectares destroyed, 80 firefighters in attendance of that incident. Uh, and then on the next slide, um, as Rob Stacey, who's on this uh, call, will no doubt bear testament to, um, in March, an incident at Burdenside, Northumberland, which is up the northeast uh, coast of, uh, of England, 139 hectares there, um, and a forestry incident, Four Laws Forest, um, which again burned for a week. Clearly not on the scale of some of the um, incidents that we see over in Canada and, uh, and the US, and perhaps other areas, but definitely an increasing pattern here for, uh, for us in the UK. By way of, uh, uh, sorry, on the next slide, um, there's a, a timeline of events across July. So July was the, the peak of the wildfire activity uh, across England last year. Uh, hopefully there you've got a red bar across the middle of your screen starting 13th of July and running on. Um, I'll let you um, read the, the slides for yourselves, but um, each of the titles in bold are obviously a geographic location. So you'll see the second one there on the top row is London, Leicestershire. So they're um, outside of the capital city. They are typically um, county areas. So that is an area covered by a specific res fire and rescue service. Uh, and you can see as we work through the timeline there, the increasing activity commensurate with time of day, temperature, reducing uh, moisture, humidity levels, uh, and so on, and how that played out. So that's the timeline. So where we arrived at um, during the course of the 18th and 19th of July was that we had 16 fire and rescue services across the um, UK declaring major incidents. Um, in response to the sheer volume of wildfire incidents that they were dealing with. Um, 
the the um, Met, the weather forecasters had predicted that we were going to run into exceptionally high temperatures over those days. So to some extent, the uh, services were uh, prepared for the um, extreme weather conditions that we were going to encounter, um, but, ha but perhaps less so um, prepared in their in terms of their ability to respond to the sheer um, volume of incidents that arose simultaneously. That's what then led to these 16 fire and rescue services declaring major incidents. So we had a lot of cross, cross um, border mobilizations, services looking for support from each other. Um, and certainly across the control rooms, um, the call volume um, rose meteorically. And again, we stood up specialist plans, uh, one called Operation Willowbeck which is a predetermined call distribution plan. So it moves the emergency calls around the control rooms in the UK and tries to spread, spread the load. Um, so I suppose the, the summary of that is it wasn't just the firefighters that were experiencing the significant demands, it was felt all the way uh, through the system. Some of the major incidents that were declared um, were, were based around single large incidents. Others were declared because of what we term spate conditions. So that's just volume, sheer volume of incidents. Um, and typically the major incident declaration comes when those services then to say, start to say we're building such a, an increase of uh, incidents of a particular type, whether that's flooding or fire in this case, um, that they then struggle to service the, the business as usual um, incident activity beneath that. So I think it's fair to say that over the 18th and the 19th, the UK uh, was fairly stretched in terms of our ability to respond to um, the spike in activity. Um, over the slide, Brian, um, we've got some examples there. So these are uh, clips taken from media um, channels, perhaps some of the uh, most high profile wildfire impacts that were felt across the UK. So this one, Village of Wennington in East London, and you can see at the bottom of the page, the summary, 41 properties destroyed. So fire sweeps across Heathland um, and into the rural, um, sorry, from the rural into the urban environment. Um, got into rows of terraced houses and clearly um, number of properties and um, both domestic, commercial, um, were, were destroyed by these fires. London, over 100 firefighters just um, deployed to this one incident. And as the uh, one of the very senior officers in London Fire Brigade reported thereafter, you can see the quote there, the busiest day since World War II uh, through the Blitz when we were getting uh, um, the bombings, you know, in terms of activity, they were comparing it to that. So 15 major fires and a number of other incidents ongoing across the UK's capital, or sorry, across England's capital um, on that uh, particular day. Um, on to the next slides, uh, this really just shows that the impact was across um, the uh, across the nation. So we had temperatures reaching 40 degrees Celsius over this period, which um, as anybody who's travelled uh, up to the UK would testify, it's very, very rare that we get those sort of temperatures. Um, and whilst many people were enjoying them, clearly uh, it wasn't a great day for many of our communities or, or indeed the fire and rescue services. So Barnsley, South Yorkshire, Northern England, fairly, uh, fairly central, Lincolnshire, over towards the East Coast. You can see um, lots of examples there. And again, over the next couple of slides, Brian, if you may, please, West Yorkshire, Gloucestershire, Dorset, down on the south coast. So it really was um, across the UK where the impacts were felt. I did say at the start, we touch on the connection between wildfire and other hazards. And hopefully uh, on the next slide, you can see there, um, assuming we're keeping track, we've got one of uh, Redsdale Forest in Northumberland and the Hawaii fires earlier this year. Um, so going back to 2022, um, the wildfires, as I said there, occurred during a drought period. 
clearly that has significant impact on the fire behaviour and the rate at which the fire spreads, um, as well as potentially impacting our ability to access water for firefighting. The photo on the left-hand side of your page there shows uh, an incident in a forest in Northumberland. Early, uh, early in 2020-21, the previous year, uh, we were hit by uh, a storm, Storm Arwen, um, across north of England, parts of Scotland. And that storm hit um, from a northerly direction, which was quite unusual for us. But what it did do was knock over lots and lots of uh, trees within those forested areas. Naturally, that timber then dried and decayed for some time. Um, and then that material um, eventually ignited subsequently and led to this forest fire in uh, 2022. So the fire burned extremely well. Um, the terrain was very, very challenging for our firefighters um, and Northumberland. And no doubt, um, if there's any questions after this presentation, um, Rob Stacey will be able to uh, field some of those. But Northumberland Fire and Rescue Service brought in specialist water bowsers, uh, helicopters to do airdrops uh, and so on. So um, I suppose some of the tactics that many colleagues across the uh, continent will be familiar with. A lot of that, in truth, was to keep the firefighters safe because the terrain was so challenging. Um, but also there was a, a military training range nearby. So it was a case of being able to stop the fire uh, and check it um, at the most critical point. So let's say this is where the, I suppose, the connection between wildfire and other significant weather events comes. And certainly uh, on the right hand side there, we've got the Hawaii incident, um, high winds, from an approaching hurricane uh, is believed to cause some of the uh, wildfires, bringing down the electricity lines into the vegetation, which then ignited and so on. And then those high winds significantly fanning uh, the intensity and the rapid rate of spread uh, across the island. And as we all saw, sadly, some, uh, some very, very devastating consequences for Hawaii earlier this year. So what are we doing in the, in the UK to try and uh, address some of this? Um, so on the next slide, Brian, um, hopefully there you can see uh, some cogs in the middle and how all these things join together. But uh, I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. I am conscious of time, so I will go through them fairly uh, swiftly. But you can see there some of the things that we are uh, focused on. So in terms of National Wildfire Attack Advisors or Tactical Advisors, these are our um, perhaps uh, more skilled, um, uh, more highly trained uh, officers that we have distributed across the UK. So we have um, mid 40s uh, in terms of numbers of wildfire attack advisors, um, and they will they work together as a group. So they will um, wherever possible train together. They will share best practice, share learning, share their experiences, but ultimately support the operational response to wildfire incidents on the ground. So they will go to other areas of um, the UK and support colleagues who are dealing with uh, significant incidents. It was first developed uh, back in 2017, deployed in 2018. And whilst it isn't a recognised national capability at the moment, that is certainly something that is uh, an ambition of, of Jim McNeil, myself, uh, and, and certainly Paul Headley before us, in terms of getting that as an established capability that is funded um, and that is uh, essentially available 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, I think they are, they are and continue to be the driving force of wildfire capability in the UK. Uh, an incredible set of people and they've done some uh, amazing work for us uh, and certainly Jim and I will be looking to continue to support um, all our wildfire attack advisors over, over the coming years. Uh, next slide touches on training and our approach there. So we have a, an, an NFCC wildfire group. Um, we have, as you can see, four levels of training uh, currently in place. And what we are doing now is working closely with colleagues in um, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, really to try and pull uh, that training together, get it accredited, and so far as we can, work to standardise it, make it consistent, um, 
but also develop a model for delivery. So can we get to a point where um, we are delivering that training sort of regionally uh, and people aren't having to travel across the UK uh, to maintain their skills uh, in wildfire. So we have a number of different levels of training uh, available. And again, this is something that we'll, uh, we're working to strengthen, as I say, and standardise. John, there is still three minutes left for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you it's okay. time, Ricardo. I'll be sure. I didn't want to interrupt, but it's fine. I'll, I'll be sure. Okay. Um, next slide. Wildfire exercises. I'm sure all, all colleagues recognise the value of exercising. And again, um, it's around cross-border sharing of practice. It's about really uh, testing the learning that our officers have had. And indeed, where, as you can see on one of the photos there, bottom right, um, where we've developed burn suppression teams, um, really, because we've got a small number of those in the UK, it's sharing the word, sharing that practice, and making sure that other services are aware that these kinds of facilities are, are available. Next slide, innovation and investment. Um, again, probably in common with uh, many colleagues across Europe, um, a lot of money being invested into different types of capabilities that can support our response, whether it's all-terrain vehicles, um, P PPE, personal protective equipment, firefighting equipment, um, or indeed drone technology. And at the moment, we're doing um, a, a lot of work to look at drone technology for the development of mapping um, of the landscape, mapping of fuel content and fuel mass, um, which can be um, assist the, the operational response and the management of, of larger uh, incidents. Next slide, contaminants and toxins. Um, so wildfires, as we know, produces, uh, produce contaminants, toxins that can enter the body through, through breathing and through the skin. Um, significant risk posts to firefighting. Uh, and again, in the interest of keeping this short, we're working with one of our universities uh, in England, the University of Central Lancashire, um, to um, look at the contamination. Um, what does the research tell us? How do we better prevent contamination and risk to firefighters taking place? And uh, in the interest of moving this on, um, happy to take any questions on that or indeed direct colleagues um, if uh, on, on to key people if, uh, if they so wish. Next slide talks about our response plans. Um, this is around pre-planning, it's about preparedness. How do we plan for incidents before they happen? How do we understand what that risk and threat uh, assessment looks like? And can we work with the resilience forums uh, in each area to better prepare and plan to be able to respond to wildfires where they do happen. So that's a piece of work that Jim and I uh, and colleagues are taking through um, at government level and then trying to push that through uh, down to the local partnership arrangements. Next slide, such as on partnership working, um, we recognise wildfire, um, it, it's very, very complex. Uh, it needs broad stakeholder engagement and that partnership approach. Uh, and you'll see there some of the, the, the key forums that we have across the UK. So the EWWF, England and Wales, um, Rob is a, a significant um, player in that. And we have similar models across Scotland and Northern Ireland. So it's very much for um, Jim and I to work uh, with colleagues in these groups and really try and pull together the cross uh, UK um, capabilities and arrangements. Uh, almost there, Ricardo. Uh, next slide talks about government. Um, so as leads for NFCC, um, the other piece of work that we're heavily involved in that seems to take a, a lot uh, a lot of our time week in, week out, the moment, working with colleagues in the Home Office, uh, in the Cabinet Office and the Department for um, the Environment, uh, uh, which is called DEFRA, um, to look at how do we pull together a national wildfire framework? So roles, responsibilities, and so on. That work is, is quite well progressed now. The next chapter then is, um, do, we, do we have a fully integrated wildfire strategy for England or indeed for the UK? Those conversations are, are ongoing. Um, but I would also say that this extends beyond um, 
local governments. So um, we're now quite engaged with colleagues across US and Canada. Um, and over the last week, I've been involved in conversations, two different uh, working groups, really, one with the, with the FEMA organization in the US uh, and the other one with NFPA, again, which is about accelerating the learning for the UK, so taking their practice, taking their knowledge, and how do we speed up uh, our advancements, how do we share best practice, uh, and so on. Um, so equally as important for us as uh, forums such as this, um, where we're engaging with colleagues from across Europe. Uh, I think we're nearly there. Last couple of slides. Lessons learned from 2022. So, uh, very quick overview of this one. Uh, at the end of the 2022 season, which, as I said, was um, exceptional for us, we ran a large scale debrief exercise and surveyed all the fire and rescue services in the UK to try and extract all the learning that had taken place from responding to those incidents. NFCC pulled together um, a report. We are just working to finalise that report at the moment, but um, part of what plays through that is that there is really learning across eight different areas, and that goes from national policy and strategy through uh, training, equipment, innovation, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and really that learning will form our uh, improvement plan for the next 12, 18 months, um, across, certainly across England and Wales, and I hope across uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland too. And perhaps given the constraints of time, Ricardo, uh, Brian, um, once that's finalised, I may be able to share something either at next roundtable event or if there's another method in the interim, um, I can share more detail on that with colleagues. But really, I suppose it's an assurance that we've took the learning from those events and we are seeking to um, embed the best practice and further develop uh, on the back of that debrief. Uh, and then the last couple of slides that I've put together are around conclusions. So. Uh, what, what have we concluded from all this? Well, if the conditions are right, very hard to stop uh, wildfires, as we see across the across the globe. We recognise in the UK that they're becoming more frequent, they're becoming more severe, and indeed, as we saw, particularly in the capital last year, they're becoming more disruptive. Everything says, doesn't it, that uh, the, this, these weather systems, the climate change impacts are being felt more and more um, across Northern Europe than they've ever been before. So we are um, absolutely assured that uh, it's going to get wetter, sorry, wetter, worse before it gets better. Might get wetter over the coming months. Um, they are a shared problem. I touched on the networks that we have across Europe and across um, US, Canada, um, Australia, and so on, because um, we recognise that there's a great deal of learning to be had. Um, we recognise that we need to continue to collaborate and involve more and more people um, to really move uh, England and the UK forward. Um, I think the last point, the point in red there is really, really key. As a society, we need to learn to adapt and live with wildfires. What I would say is that the population in the UK, I think, um, received a real wake up call in 2022. Um, but we still have a lot more work to do to really get the population to understand um, wildfires, what the risk is, how their behaviours potentially lead to increased risk of wildfires, but more importantly, how um, they can play a part in preventing wildfires and, um, as colleagues will, will be familiar with, how do they uh, protect their own properties, make defensible spaces and ultimately... Uh, build that community resilience that, that's also important in terms of um, reducing the damage and the effect of, of these kinds of fires. Okay, I'll pause at that um, and I'll hand back to you, Ricardo, but naturally I'm happy to take any questions.